Welcome to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., and welcome to a day long awaited by both fans of this YouTube channel. I have been promising the arrival of this video for quite some time. Dinner roll, please. It is time to release the results of the King James Bible Study Project. The King James Bible Study Project is a phone survey completed this year in which I and volunteers called 100 King James Version only pastors and asked them 20 questions gauging their understanding of various King James difficulties. 10 questions were asked about second person pronouns in the King James, 10 questions about false friends in the King James, which you'll understand if you've seen the channel. In this video, I will cover the pronouns. Next video, which also releases today in an hour, I'll cover the false friends. Note, if you are one of the pastors who took my survey, I urge you to first watch the video that I made privately for you. This video you're watching is not primarily for you. Though I certainly don't mind if you watch. I will reveal no identities of these pastors because I promise not to, but all non-personal data will be available at kjbstudyproject.com. That will include the demographic data that we collected, but again, nothing revealing personal identities. Before we get started, I want to thank the Museum of the Bible staff for giving me some beautiful spaces in which to shoot. A thanks goes also to today's, today's volunteer cameraman, Caleb Richardson, who made the great majority of the 100 phone calls. Thank you also to the others who made calls for the survey. Now, suffer me a little introduction. You know the martial art called Aikido, in which someone throws a punch at you and you duck out of the way and then you use their momentum to flip them onto the ground. On their back, you've seen this. I like Aikido. So I have heard many times from defenders of exclusive use of the King James Version that it is absolutely crucial to keep using the King James exclusively and only the King James all the time because the these and thous of Elizabethan English are far more accurate in translation than the simple you of contemporary English. As I've repeatedly said, they have a point. This punch makes contact. But Aikido, don't forget Aikido, because two picoseconds after this punch admittedly makes contact with seven whiskers on my face. But before it reaches the iron jaw underneath, I have deftly moved my head out of the way and I have already begun to grab my assailant's arm in preparation for the flip that you'll see in this video. I've also taken the opportunity to grab his wallet to remove the farthings therein to give these farthings to a fund for people who need Bible translations in their own English. And I have taken the time then to scrawl a Bible verse reference on top of the photo of the puncher's girlfriend. 1 Corinthians 14, 9, all the best, Mark. This all happened so fast that I find most humans can't actually see it without the aid of a special slow motion cameras that I am too poor to afford. So please support my YouTube channel on Patreon if you wish to learn how to execute this particular Aikido move yourself. Here's the verse that my assailant quotes at me. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. That's Luke 22:31 31 in the King James. This is what he says while he throws that punch. The word you is plural here as every King James reader knows, because you is plural in the accurate English of the King James Version, while the is the singular form. Modern versions are misleading here, says my assailant, making readers think that Jesus is talking to Peter alone, because in the less accurate English of today, you has to do double duty as singular and plural. Hast thou heard this argument from King James defenders? I've heard it four score and seven times. King James only leader David Cloud makes this argument, for example. He says the King James Version is superior to modern versions in its distinction between the singular and plural second person pronouns. The skillful but anonymous writer behind the website kjvtoday.com wrote that this distinction is crucial for a close reading of the Bible. R.B. Willett, in his book, A More Sure Word, Which Bible Can You Trust?, criticizes the New King James Version for the same reason. He says, the pronouns of this version are less precise than the King James. One King James only brother who calls himself a Christian philosopher said that because the new simplified King James Version, which has just come out in the last year or so from Barber Publishing, because it does not distinguish singular and plural second person pronouns, he said, that's a deal killer for me. There are several passages where that distinction is important. And I had one cleverly cheeky commenter here on my YouTube channel who made the very same argument that I've been quoting from others. He argued that because the New King James Version uses contemporary English, it misleads readers in this verse and in many others. He actually tried to Aikido me 
calling you in the modern versions a false friend. This is what he wrote. So we have tens of thousands of cases in the New King James Version where that false friend, you, is constantly throwing mud in the eyes of its readers where the King James Version does not. I believe, again, that this argument does have some truth in it. You is indeed an ambiguous form in contemporary English. It can mean either singular you or plural you, making a verse like 2231 ambiguous in some translations. Is Jesus saying that this potential satanic sifting was directed at Peter or at all the disciples? Did Jesus mean you or y'all, in other words? King James English had specific forms for singular, that's thee, thy, and thine, and for plural, ye, you, and your, second person pronouns. So an astute King James reader will know that Jesus is speaking of all the disciples here in Luke 22. Or else the translation would have said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he may sift thee as wheat. Again, this punch touches my whiskers, some of my very favorite ones too. But there are three major Aikido moves that I will make in response to this punch. First the dodge, then the flip, then the body slam onto extra soft pillows that I have prepared for this purpose. Don't worry, no King James Version defenders will be physically harmed during the making of the videos that you're about to see. Here's the dodge. Modern translations typically do indicate what's going on here in the same way that all translations in all languages do whenever they come across, whenever the translators of those Bibles come across something that's kind of important, that is difficult or maybe even impossible to communicate clearly and efficiently in the target language into which they're translating. They use footnotes or other workarounds. So King James defenders have actually cited this very passage, Luke 22, 31, to me, and I've seen it in their books as an important instance in which the King James Version is accurate and the modern versions inaccurate. But have they actually read the modern versions here at Luke 22, 31? The ESV translates the text literally, but it includes a footnote with a clear explanation. Here's the translation. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. In English, that's ambiguous, plural or singular. But here's the note. The Greek word for you, twice in this verse, is plural. In verse 32, all four instances are singular. The NIV makes a very simple move within the translation that makes the plural clear. No footnote needed. Listen to this. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. The Net Bible does something similar to the NIV. It also has a study note like that of the English Standard Version. Satan has demanded to have you all, to sift you like wheat. Here's the net note. This pronoun is plural in the Greek text, so it refers to all the disciples of which Peter is the representative. The New Living Translation tries another strategy that's available for communicating Jesus' plural reference in today's English. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. So contemporary standard English does have ways of marking the plural in situations like this. None are perhaps as elegant as the option available to the King James translators, but today's translators surely can communicate using contemporary English the difference between plural and singular. Admittedly, I checked my standard list of contemporary English Bibles, and there were a few that did not choose to make the number of the pronouns in Luke 22, 31 clear. The Christian Standard Bible was one of these. I'm not sure why. The New King James Version was another. Attentive, knowledgeable readers of the King James Version will do better in this one little spot on this one little point than readers of those two common modern versions that I enjoy so much. But how many readers of the King James Version are this knowledgeable and this attentive? That leads us to the flip. King James readers are mostly not getting what Jesus is saying in Luke 22, 31, despite the admittedly superior accuracy of the second person pronouns in the King James Version. And I now have public proof. The King James Bible Study Project. 100% of the 100 men that we polled preach and teach exclusively from the King James. Many of them use only the King James ever, even in their personal study. They told us this. All were graduates of King James-only institutions, and all pastor churches or attend churches with solidly King James-only doctrinal statements. Some are graduates of Crown College, some of Hiles Anderson, some of Pensacola Christian College, some of Ambassador Baptist College, some of West Coast Baptist College, some of Golden State Baptist College, and some of other smaller schools. In the first half of the King James Bible Study Project survey, I and my volunteers read 10 verses from the King James to each of the pastors, and we asked them to tell us whether the second person pronouns contained therein were singular or plural. They were also told that they could say, I don't know. 
I did not choose tricky examples because, by definition, there aren't any. The rule is very clear. Second person pronouns beginning with Y, that is ye, you, or your, they are plural. Second person pronouns beginning with T, thee, thou, thy, and thine, they are singular. But I did choose examples in which you have to know this grammatical rule, this simple rule, in order to get the answer right. I also gave the 100 pastors two especially easy ones, gimmies, at the beginning, starting with, ye are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. Only I was wrong to expect the great majority of the King James only pastors to get this one right. As the results started coming in, I was truly surprised. Just over half got the first gimme right. As we go along, I will show you the survey results for each of the 10 questions in this portion of the survey. I'll put them up on the screen. Do you see the graph here that I'm putting up? The bar on the left in each graph will show how many King James only pastors got a given question right. The bar in the middle will tally up the wrong answers. The bar on the right represents those who told us that they did not know, and there were often a few of those. And I think you'll agree that this first question gives a rather poor showing for such a common and simple word as ye. The pastors did well, however, as I expected on the second gimme, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Thy there is clearly talking to God, so it's obviously singular, even if you don't know that T pronouns are singular and Y pronouns are plural. This tends to suggest, too, that the pastors were not forgetting what singular and plural mean. They were accurately understanding at least that much in the survey. This was by far, this second question, the best the pastors did on any of the 10 questions on the pronoun portion of the survey, or any of the 20 questions overall. As we proceeded, however, the results started to confirm my guess that King James only pastors are of like passions as we are, that they speak contemporary English, just like me, far better than they decode Elizabethan English. Indeed, the other eight pronoun questions featured passages in which the plural word you was used in the King James, but which sound singular in context. Like the verse which I discussed earlier, our third survey question, Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. When the 100 pastors were asked whether the word you there was singular or plural, a sad total of eight got it right. One did not know. 91 King James only pastors got this simple, straightforward question wrong. One may argue that if I gave more context, that might help, and one could say this for any of these second person pronoun questions, but more context should not be necessary because the rule is, again, crystal clear and commonly reported in King James only literature. This is not supposed to be hard. One good friend of mine who prefers the Textus Receptus as it happens, he's a Bible translator, he actually discouraged me from doing this part of the survey at all. He thought that everybody I contacted would basically get a perfect score. Presumably, too, King James using pastors already know the context of Luke 22, 31. King James pastors are Bible people. This was the best thing I myself got out of my time in King James Onlyism as a teenager. These King James Only pastors, they know this conversation between Jesus and Peter. So, yes, the King James Version is technically more accurate and certainly more elegant than modern versions at Luke 22, 31. But what does that matter, brothers and sisters, if contemporary readers don't understand it? What good is an accurate translation if even King James only pastors don't receive the packets of grammatical meaning that were intended by the translators? Maybe it was accurate in 1611, I think it was, but can it really be called accurate today? As I often say, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to read it, should anyone in the village remain King James only? The KJV is not inaccurate, but modern translations have ways of making the singular and plural clear to modern readers. Shouldn't such ways be used instead? You will think I am mocking the poor souls who gave their time to my team for the King James Bible Study Project, about 20 minutes per call. Far be it from me to mock, and I mean that. I do not blame anyone for being ignorant of subtle changes in English that have happened over the centuries. I am not trying to deride or certainly even to defeat these King James only pastors. I'm trying to win them. I know they want to understand God's word, and they want their people to understand as well. But here, on the very point, including the very verse where their leaders, their pamphleteers and book writers, have insisted upon the absolute superiority of the King James Version, these pastors are misunderstanding due to changes in English over time. And not only here, 
What follows are the seven other passages that my team asked them about, with brief comments, I promise, appended to each. I'll go a lot faster through these. How would you have done if one of my volunteers had called you and asked whether you was singular or plural in these verses? Here's question four. Swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness. That comes from Joshua 2.12. In this passage, Rahab is speaking to two men. That is the spies that she had hidden in flax on her roof. I feel that this is a passage in which more context would definitely have helped. The pastors get this question right. Is you singular or plural? But again, that isn't supposed to be necessary. And this means, again, that the King James is no better at getting the meaning across than modern versions because, of course, they communicate the context too. Question five, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's Matthew 5, 12 in the King James, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to a group. I'm not sure that this is a crucial interpretive detail, but it is a clear one to anyone who knows the grammatical rule in the King James Version. Just over half of the pastors got this one. Question six, and Jethro said to Moses, blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. You'll note that I put in, to Moses in brackets because we did read those words to the King James pastors. Jethro was speaking of all the Israelites being delivered. I'm not sure that this is a crucial interpretive detail, but it is a clear one to anyone who knows the grammatical rule in the King James Version but only a third of the pastors got this one. Question seven, a passage that's a good bit more significant, I think, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. King James only pastors did a bit better on let this mind be in you, just over half got it. I did not do so well, actually, growing up. I assumed for my whole life as a King James reader that this verse was speaking to individuals. But when I began reading the English Standard Version in my English in the early 2000s, I encountered this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That is clearly plural, yourselves. Once again, it did not matter that King James English is closer to the Greek than modern English. The ESV language actually helped me understand in the way the King James did not, because the ESV translators knew they had to find a way to communicate the plural to me in my English. They could not rely on the elegant solution the King James translators used, which was the simple word you. Question eight out of 10. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This is another false friend that always tripped me up as a King James reader. Apparently, I was not alone. Around 60% of King James only pastors also failed to get this one. I don't actually think I got the overall idea wrong. I think the reference is singular, even if the sense is plural. It's kind of like a pastor saying to a mixed group, the way we treat our wife says a lot about our character. Technically, our wife mixes plural, our, and singular, wife, in a way that a literalistically minded 12-year-old might turn into a joke about polyandry. I guess I just did that. But everybody knows exactly what the preacher means by the way we treat our wife. And everybody knows exactly what Paul means when he says your, plural, body, singular. What I'm actually questioning here is whether the distinction between singular and plural second person pronouns is always crucial for a close reading of the Bible. It ought to be okay for translators to be trusted to make a judgment about whether and how to reflect minor grammatical features like this. The only way to get all of the grammatical and stylistic information that God inspired in the Hebrew and in the Greek is to learn the Hebrew and to learn the Greek. Even then, you probably won't get it all. I don't, because you're not a native speaker, and I certainly am not. And that's okay. This is the way God set things up, and he is still good. Question nine out of 10. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's James 4, 7 in the King James, and this is clearly plural. Plural in Elizabethan English, plural in the Greek, but passages like this are just as clearly, I think, individual in emphasis, which is why so few King James only pastors got this one, and I didn't either growing up. That is, you can tell a whole classroom, please turn in your homework assignments, plural, on time this week. And though you mean plural your and plural assignments, each individual student, singular, is intended only to do his or her own individual singular homework assignment, not some group assignment or everybody does everybody's assignment. A King James defender might well say about James 4, 7 then that even if people misunderstand the word you, if, for example, 65% of King James only pastors assume it's singular and not plural, that this is not a big deal. And actually, I don't think it is. 
But then, if it's not a big deal, it's not crucial for a close reading of the Bible and should not be used as a deal killer for adopting revisions of the King James Version. Now the tenth and final second person pronoun question, Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is a classic memory verse. I memorized it growing up in Awana. And this is another group sense with an individual reference. Yet again, the pastors did not do well. My description of this portion of the survey, the first portion, is now done. I went through it quickly, but you are welcome to go through it slowly on the King James Bible Study Project website. Overall, the King James only pastors got a total score of 44% on this second person pronoun portion of the survey. A little worse than if they'd all just done a coin flip. And importantly, only seven of the 100 respondents got every single second person pronoun correct. That means that 93% of King James only pastors do not know the simple grammatical rule about T pronouns and Y pronouns. 93% of King James only pastors are missing out on what King James only apologists consistently call crucial for Bible interpretation. 93% of King James only pastors are missing out on the only way to translate the Bible correctly. 93% of King James only pastors are misunderstanding what many King James onlyists regard as a sufficient reason by itself for them to reject all modern English Bibles. I acknowledged in my book authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible, and I have repeatedly acknowledged on this very YouTube channel that the King James Version is, in a sense, in a definite sense, more accurate than the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the Christian Standard Bible, for example, when it comes to second-person pronouns, in this sense of being more efficient and more like the Greek which it translates. But it's only more accurate if you remember to speak its English and not your own. And the people who are most likely in all of the world to speak, or at least to understand, the English of the King James Version, they demonstrated conclusively in my survey that they do not, not at this point. They treat the word you in King James English the very same way that they treat it in contemporary English, namely as either singular or plural, depending on the context. That's the way it works in our English. Once again, I refuse to mock these men. I do not think it is any individual English speaker's fault that we all know our English far, far better than we know the English of somebody else. The English of those in Kenya, the English of those in Singapore, the English of those in the Elizabethan era. We indeed default to our English. It is so, so hard to make yourself remember that an excessively common word like you actually means something different in the King James Version than it does to us in our English. Also, I'll bet that many of these pastors who took my survey, I'll bet they would preach the text accurately if they had time to study it. It's just that theoretically, they're supposed to be teaching their people how to read the King James and uh, how to read its English. And theoretically, they shouldn't need to study something as basic and common as the simple word you, especially because it's well known, this word is, the word you, as one of the alleged points of vast superiority within the King James Version. I have decided, therefore, to put you in the King James Version on my official list of false friends. You is ambiguous in contemporary English. It can mean singular you or plural you. So readers know to look to context in contemporary English texts. But it was not ambiguous in King James English. And this means that sometimes contemporary readers will be misled by you in the King James Version in ways that presumably readers 400 years ago were not. The King James translators did not have to give the contextual clues that many modern versions use to indicate whether, for example, Jesus was speaking in Luke 22, 31 to a group of disciples or to one individual disciple. They, these translators of 400 years ago, could rely on an efficient and elegant method of communicating number in their second person pronouns. Now, I think you and I both may have forgotten my martial arts metaphor, but I've got to recover it now because we've only just executed the Aikido flip. There's a body slam video coming. Our opponent at this moment is still flying through the air and has not yet contacted the soft pillows that I have placed carefully on the floor for his benefit. When he gets up, I pray he will cry with a great voice, that was fun, you have won. Henceforth, are we no longer opponents, but friends? We fight for the same dojo. But I regret that until that point, until my, my opponent says these words, the body slam is still necessary. Watch my next video, also releasing today.